Who's Audie Leon Murphy? Anybody? Sweet. You guys in the military? Yeah? Is that where you heard about him? Normally, pardon me? Military history class. Okay. Normally, I, I throw this up because nobody knows who uh, Audie Leon Murphy is. And I'll, I'll, read what he, I'll read what I pulled off Wikipedia. I'm assuming it's accurate. <laughs> Audie Leon Murphy was one of the most decorated American combat soldiers of World War II, receiving every military combat award for valor available from the U.S. Army, as well as French and Belgium awards for heroism. Murphy received the Medal of Honor for Valor demonstrated at the age of 19 for single-handedly holding off an entire company of German soldiers for an hour at the Colmar Pocket in France in January 1945, and then leading a successful counterattack while wounded and out of am ammunition. After war, Murphy enjoyed a 21-year acting career, was a fairly accomplished songwriter, and bred quarter horses in California and Arizona, becoming a regular participant in horse racing. Murphy died in a plane crash in Virginia in 1971, shortly before his 46th birthday. My point here is that typically nobody knows who Audie Leon Murphy is. And so my point is, he's the most decorated military dude. He had a 21-year acting career. He bred and raised, and raised horses and died in what year? 71. Like it hasn't even been 100 years and nobody knows who this dude is. And, and so because we're all hard charging and we want, to, we want to accomplish, 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 I'm here to tell you in 100 years, nobody's gonna know who the hell you are. It's just the way it is. Like, so you gotta check like, what's the point? in all this striving. Um, Solomon is like a dude that I, that I love in the Old Testament. He had, he had more sex than anybody probably ever. I think he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. That's a thousand women and there's only 365 days in a year. Like Hugh Hefner's a chump, <laughs> seriously. Like some people planted gardens, Solomon planted forests. He built the temple. He'd throw parties, they said, that were so big, entire vineyards were wiped out from the wine that they served. Like we go get a fat steak, he would wipe out a whole herd of cattle for his parties. Like you had a fat DJ, he had the killers and Madonna. Like, he had all the people actually there. Like, it was a fat party, and it would last like seven days. And, and he went around for, for most of his life saying, I'm going to try this and see if this makes me happy. I'm going to have as much sex as I can. I'm going to see if that makes me happy. No, that didn't do it. I'm going to go build stuff. I'm going to build so much stuff, like, that's going to satisfy me. No, nope, that didn't do it. I'm going to throw parties. I'm going to get drunk. Nope, that wore off. And at the end of the day, he said, it's all meaningless. It's a chasing after the wind. He said, have a steak, drink some wine, and enjoy your friends. Relationships matter more than all that other stuff. And I say that in the juxtaposition of, I just said, we're built to work. So, you, God might want you to set world records. Do it, man. Go for it. But don't lose sight of the fact that at the end of the day, in 100 years from now, nobody's probably going to know who you are. The people that live life with you, your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids, leave a legacy to them. And so, you got to be careful with the, the moving target slide that, I, that was just up. Because I... I know a lot of people that say, hey, I just want to get to here. If I get to here, it's going to do it for me. I'll be good. You know, 
I'm gonna throw my trainer under the bus because he's not here, so I can do that, right? John Meadows, I just want to turn pro. I just want to turn pro. It took him forever to turn pro. And I think he told me he was going to retire when he turned pro. And then all of a sudden, he's doing like six contests a year as soon as he turned pro. I just want to qualify for the Olympia. What if he qualifies for the Olympia? Is he going to retire? I don't know. I love John, just so you know. Like, I'm not dogging him because I've done, I mean, I've done the same thing. Like, I just want to accomplish this. And you get there and you're like, hmm, I could probably do that though too. Um, don't be the type of person that's always moving the goalpost. If you make a touchdown, don't move the goalpost another 10 yards and say, ah, let's do it again, you know? Because if you get too caught up in that, you're gonna, your life's gonna get out of balance. And so the rest area slide, um, the creation account. People could argue, is that a literal or figurative or whatever? Or is it even true? But on the seventh day, God rested. Like, was he really tired? Did he need a nap? I mean, he did create the world and everything in it and us. Like, maybe he did need a nap. But I don't think he needed a nap. I think he created the Sabbath, which I'm not trying to get churchy on you, but it was a day of rest. Take it for what it is. It's a, it's a day to take a nap. He created it. He, he rested it himself, I believe, not because he needed it, because he wanted to show us what it looked like to rest and because it's good for us to rest. That's why, that's why we get tired and we go to bed every night. I think he put it in us because he knows if we don't do this, some of us are too hard charging. We're going to get, we're going to overwork. We're going to work ourselves into the ground. So take time, take time to rest. Here we have a slide of people that look like they're friends. I may have dated myself, I don't know. Um, and, they're, and they're having sugar. And there's, bre there's cow's breast milk in that too, probably. Um, what do I want to say about friends? Um, I've heard it said that you're the, you're the sum of the three people that you hang out with the most. Okay. I guess, who are those three people that you hang out with the most? If you were the sum of those three people, would you like who you are? If not, maybe you need a new crew to run with. And um, I know from my perspective... I meet every Tuesday morning at 7 a.m., which means I got to go to the gym that morning and train from at 4, 4 to 5.30 so I can get home and get to meet coffee with these guys at 7 to 8. But I do that every week, um, and these guys got license to speak into my life. Um, what that means is they have... My, they have my permission, they have my wife's permission to kick me in the nuts if they need to and say, what the hell are you doing, man? Um, you can't get that with, with Instagram followers and Facebook friends. It takes face to face. Um, the Bible says that iron sharpens iron. And that's a violent, that's a violent process to sharpen iron with iron. That's a violent process. But it, it says that that's what, that's, what two, that's what it's like between two friends that really care for each other. It's like iron sharpening iron. And it's a violent process at times. And it also says that, that uh, the enemy multiplies kisses, but the wounds of a friend can be trusted. And this doesn't mean that every Tuesday morning we just beat each other up. But it, it does mean that these guys got license to speak into my life. And, and they're people that I trust, that Christina trusts. And so we give them that opportunity, and that helps me to create a balance in my life, if you will. So finding balance, this is my summary. Uh, build a list. By list, I mean priority list. And I showed you mine. Yours doesn't have to be the same as mine. But, you know, write it down if you have to, but create a list. What are your priorities? And I'll, and I'll also say back to my priority list, 
you know, Jesus, Christina, my daughters, um, those at my business, my friends, those in bodybuilding, ask yourself, if I died tomorrow, like in my case, if I died tomorrow, what do I want Jesus to say about me? If I die tomorrow, what do I want Christina to say about me? If I die tomorrow, what do I want my daughters to say about me? What do I want my friends to say? What do I want my employees at my work to say? And if you may not know what they would say, you could ask them. Um, but write down what do, you, what do you want them to say? And then what do you need to do to have them say that when you do die? That's the be intentional part. If I want her to, to say that I loved her well, what does that look like? What do I have to do? That's why Saturday night's date night. Because we've been married 19 years, but it doesn't mean I... I shouldn't romance my wife because if I'm not going to do it, I might wake up and find some other dude doing it. And we, we used to have date night every other week, but life gets busy and we would miss. And then from one to the next, it was four weeks and that's a month. When I first met her, I could not not take her on a date for a month. I'd go nuts. Why should it be any different today? We just have to be more intentional doesn't mean everything's going to be like it was when we first met. The truth is a lot of things are way better now because I know we're that much better. But you have to be intentional. You have to figure out if you want people to say such, such things about you if you were gone, be intentional and figure out a plan as to how you would create that. Um, create margins. That's part of, I guess, part of rest. Create margins in your life. Like don't work so hard like I get up, I go to the gym, I come home, I rush, I go to work, I come home, I rush back to the gym and train again. Like don't, if you make, so that make, if you make your life so busy that you have no time for margin, particularly, I can say this with my daughters, I cannot schedule pouring into the lives of a teenage girl. I can't schedule that. And, it typically have, and they typically need me when I want to go to bed because I'm exhausted from a long day of work and a leg workout. And there's times I just got to stay up. Um, create margins so that you have time for the people that matter in your life. And, that's, and then, you know, value relationships. At the end of the day, you know, your car, your brand new car, if you have one, in 20 years, it's a hoopty. A hoopty in my day was like a junker car, if you don't know that term. But in 20 years, your car's a hoopty. This might be the fattest ride around right now, but 20 years, it's a hoopty. 10 years, your clothes are garage sale material. They'll be at Goodwill, unless you keep it long enough. My daughter actually bought like one of those lambskin jeans jackets, and it looks like almost what I wore when I was her age. So if you keep it long, and you know, maybe if you keep it 25 years, it'll come back in style. But point being, most of your stuff is garage sale material in 10 years. So accumulating stuff won't give you the satisfaction that the relationships will, not from my experience at least. And I'm, I'm prone to all that same stuff. Chase after comfort, chase after possessions, chase after what, what have you, but there's never been any real contentment in that, in the end. You know, we talk about wanting to be happy. <clears throat> happy is a fleeting emotion. I could be unhappy and you can come give me a back rub and I might be happy. Um, I might find out that my daughter was making out in the car with her boyfriend and the neighbors saw her and it was that's offensive to me or something and could make me unhappy. We're after joy. You can actually be joyful and content when the doctor calls and says you have cancer. But not if your identity is all built on things that are that are frivolous, you know, that can be taken away. I mean, I hope that I can train till I they put me in a box and put me in the dirt. Um, 
But if that doesn't happen, my identity isn't entirely wrapped up in that. I'll be okay. So that was it for my presentation. Uh, thank you all very much for, for listening. 